Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another installment of A Rebel Without Applause coming to you from my little nutshell of infinite space. I'm looking out my window. I see some dinosaurs and I see a mammal both together, a squirrel and a bird. And that's fitting because my guest today is truly an apex predator when it comes to paleontology and evolutionary biology. He is the author of two incredible books. One is called the right i gotta want to get it right the, you tell me steve the title of the uh, oh yes i love marketing my books so i'm happy to tell you so a few years ago i wrote one called the rise and fall of the dinosaurs right which is about the the history of dinosaurs it's basically a biography of dinosaurs where they came from how they became right. humans, how some became birds how they died right. uh, and then i followed it up just now just this summer with a new book uh, called the rise and reign of the mammals which takes over the story after the dinosaurs died as mammals replace the dinosaurs but it then rewinds back to 325 million years ago to the root of the mammal family and then it tells the story 325 million years ago until now, how mammals became mammals, how mammals survived underfoot of the dinosaurs, took over from the dinosaurs, and then diversified into bats and elephants and whales and dogs and cats and monkeys and ultimately us. Right. And so now I'm actually getting an interview with one of those mammals. <laughs> That's it's, right. We are mammals. You we know? are mammals. So we, we are, are actually part of this genetic trail going back to prehistory. And one of the preconceptions I've read both books and they're i just by word of uh recommendation they're fantastic Thanks. one of the preconceptions is we have or like people like me is that well the mammals came after the dinosaurs when in fact they were contemporaneous that the mammals actually as you described lived in presumably the shadow of the dinosaurs that is spot on and i think a lot of people have that idea that dinosaurs had their day they ruled the world that asteroid came down, wiped out the dinosaurs, then mammals evolved to take their place. And, and there's a reason. That's often how the story is kind of told or insinuated, whether it's in television shows or, you know, books at school. And it's, it's largely true. It is true. The dinosaurs had their day. The asteroid killed them off. Then mammals replaced them as the most diverse, most dominant, for lack of a better term, animals mm -hmm. on land. But dinosaurs and mammals actually go back to the same starting point. The first true mammals were rising up along with the first dinosaurs about 225 million years ago on the supercontinent of Pangaea, back in the Triassic period. This is the time when all the land was gathered together right. as one. Now, even 100 million years previously, there were these proto-mammals, the things that were evolving bit by bit, hair and different kinds of teeth and milk and this kind of stuff. And then what happened? Children, what well, happened with the hair? Too, I'm losing mine uh, at a shockingly fast rate. <laughs> um, and I know when I write about hair, I, I just, it, it, it breaks my heart. You know, I, I shed a tear on the page as I'm writing about the hair that most mammals have. But, I'm losing, but, uh, but, it, but it's these kind of things that make mammals mammals and they evolve bit by bit. And then by 225 million years ago, you have these small, furry, smart, warm blooded, uh, animals that fed their babies milk. They, we call them true mammals. At the same time, dinosaurs were getting their start. And of course, the two groups would then be intertwined from that point until today. today. Uh, but they had very separate fates. The dinosaurs went big. The dinosaurs were destined for grandeur. Some dinosaurs became bigger than jet airplanes. Others were T-Rexes the, the size of buses. And then some became birds and, and began to fly. The mammals they were relegated to the shadows. The dinosaurs kept the mammals small. There was no room for mammals to get bigger in a world with brontosauruses and T-Rex. Sort of like my career in show business, relegated to the shadows. I am <laughs> waiting for an asteroid to hit to kill all the other actors and the comedians so that it will create the space for me to become a velociraptor in my own I'll time. tell you, Bill, you know, some of the, the best innovation comes in the shadows, right? You got to endure. You got to eke out a living sometime. You got to survive with the big boys. And uh, and that's what mammals did. Okay. And in many ways, mammals were the supporting actors. They were the, the hardworking, everyday comedians, the ones going to gigs every day, putting in the time. Maybe <laughs> Good to know. Get the recognition. But I tell you what, the same way I'm sure you hone your act with every gig you do, every podcast you do, these mammals are doing the same. The dinosaurs dominated that world, but because mammals had to be small and had to live underground and had to only come out at night, 
They had to innovate. They had to endure. They had to survive. And they did a really good job at it. So for 150 million years, mammals lived with dinosaurs. And those mammals never got bigger than a badger, as far as we know. But although they were small, these mammals were incredibly diverse. There were scurriers, there were diggers, there were climbers, there were swimmers, there were gliders, ones that had wings to glide between the trees. Mm -hmm. And they were doing all of this at tiny size. And so if you were around back then, you might not have seen these mammals. You maybe wouldn't appreciate them. But my goodness, they were so innovative. And they were evolving even keener intelligence. And they were evolving new types of teeth and new ways of caring for their babies, things that would come in handy later on. So really, it's true, the dinosaurs kept the mammals small, but conversely, the mammals kept the dinosaurs big because mammals were so good at living incognito, at being those supporting actors, those B-list characters, whatever you want to say, they were so good at it that you never saw a T-Rex the size of a mouse or a Triceratops the size of a rat because that was the domain of the mammals. And that only changed. 66 million years ago that day when that asteroid fell out of the sky and rewrote history. So it was it once the worst day in the planet's history was, in hindsight, may have been the very best day, at least from where we sit today. For us, it was. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a kind of cosmically trippy thing to think about that we had ancestors that stared down that asteroid 66 million years ago, literally one day, just out of the sky, this six mile wide rock crashed down. And this was a piece of space junk, really. It could have gone anywhere. Right. But it, it made a beeline for the Earth. It smashed into the Earth with the force of over one billion nuclear bombs put together. It unleashed chaos. And the dinosaurs, T Rex was there, Triceratops was there. They were unquestionably on top of their game. They were the dominant animals. And then it all changed because. Within moments, you had earthquakes and wildfires and tsunamis. And, and then you had over the next you know, few years, all that gunk that went into the atmosphere, it blocked out the sun. It became a cold, dark, global nuclear winter and plants couldn't grow and the forest collapsed and the plant eating animals died and the meat eaters had no food and ecosystems collapsed like houses of cards. 75% of species died. You know, three out of every four things died quite quickly. but some mammals survived. They had what it took, and it was living in the shadow of the dinosaurs for so long, having to be resilient, having to be survivors, being able to hide, to burrow, to eat lots of different foods, to grow fast. All those things that mammals, they honed as survival instincts, really, to, to deal with the dinosaurs. They now were the winning ticket to surviving that catastrophe that killed the dinosaurs. Now, at the moment that the asteroid hit, were the continents in relatively the same position that they are today? Would the map of the world been recognizable or was we still closer to the, a more Pangea-like uh, conception? It would have been pretty recognizable. So when the first dinosaurs and mammals originated in the Triassic period, that was Pangaea. That was the one continent. Right. All the world's land was smashed together into one. It stretched from the North Pole to the South Pole. And then over the next 150 you know, plus million years, that supercontinent gradually broke apart. And by the time the asteroid hit, you had a South America and an Africa, and you had a North America and you know an Asia and so on. There were bits of differences. So India was still south of the equator. India is actually an old piece of the southern lands that has moved upwards and then smashed into Asia only about 50 million years ago, and that's what created the Himalayas. So India back then was was actually an island that was in the middle of the water and it was just moving upwards. Uh, sea levels were much higher then. There were no ice caps at the poles. So a lot of Europe and even a lot of the lowlands of North America were flooded. So the coastlines would have been different. But by and large, the world that T-Rex lived in, the world that you know awoke that morning with no knowledge, no inkling that this asteroid would change everything, that world, at least the geography of it, would have looked pretty familiar to us. Now, would some of those creatures that survived may have just benefited from the fact that they were farther from the point of impact. Yes, undoubtedly, it would have been worse the closer you were. So ground zero was the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, right. very close to Cancun, where Cancun is now. 
and there's a crater there. It's mostly covered by the water of the Gulf of Mexico today, so it's not immediately obvious. Plus, it's so big, this crater is over 100 miles wide. And so that was the impact site. Anything within probably 1,000 miles or so, give or take, would have been vaporized, just turned to ghosts. I mean, just unfathomable. And then kind of the, the farther out you got, you know, the effects of, of the asteroid, uh, you know, got, got kind of less and less severe. But in much of North America, you know, a lot of the North American continent would have been, I don't know, a few thousand miles from the Yucatan, from the impact site. Those dinosaurs and mammals and everything living there would have been in pretty serious trouble. They wouldn't have been vaporized instantaneously. Right. But they, there would have been fires that would have raged across the continent. There would have been huge earthquakes. There would have been tsunamis, these tidal waves that maybe were taller than the Empire State Building would have just smashed into the land. And then once all that dirt and grime and smoke and soot and all that stuff went into the atmosphere and blocked out the sun, then Nuclear it became winter. a global problem. Yeah. Now it was all around the world, no matter where you were, things were bad. What a catastrophe. Now you're talking about all these creatures and so many, uh, you know, you get the impression that you walk outside and there'd be like a thigh bone of a prehistoric mammal just sticking out of the ground. Like just for me, like I, I hike a lot. I don't, I don't ever, I look around, I don't see the fossils. I want to, I want to go on a dig. I want to like, are they, cause when I talk to somebody like you, they're everywhere. The first thing I'll say is that paleontology is a really accessible science. It's, it's almost a, a populist type of science because anybody can find a fossil. You don't need to have a PhD. You don't need to be a professor. And a lot of the, the most amazing discoveries are not found by the university guys like me. They're found by hikers, by farmers, by construction workers. Sometimes children find fossils right. when they're out walking with their parents. Really what it comes down to is being in the right place. Because in order to find fossils, you find fossils inside of rocks, because fossils are things like bones and teeth that have been transformed into rocks. And so you need to be looking in rocks of the right age and the right type. So let's say you wanted to find a T-Rex. You're only going to be able to do that in rocks that were formed during the very end of the Cretaceous period. And they need to be rocks that were formed in the places T-Rex lived. So rivers, lakes, you know, not the deep ocean, not in the middle of a volcano. So you start to see how, you know, you, you kind of narrow it down. And so a big part of our job is doing our homework, consulting geological maps of, of the earth, because a lot of the earth has been mapped. People want to know where the diamonds are, where the gold is, where the oil is. Right. And so we can then pinpoint places that meet the criteria. There's rocks of the right age and the right type. And then we simply go to these places and we look around and there's nothing fancy about it. There's no radar or sonar or anything. We shoot into the rocks to see what's inside. It doesn't work. People have tried. But instead, this is really old fashioned. It's almost like, you know, a gold prospector's game. We go out with our rock hammer. We look around. We see if there's anything weird sticking out of the rocks, anything with a different color, a different texture, a different shape. And if there is, we'll dig in further. You know, the world that you live in, you know, there's, of course, the science of geology and identifying our history by the rocks you look at. So, for example, a couple of weeks ago, I was up fly fishing in the eastern Sierra and you can see where the volcano was. You can see the lava flow coming out of the earth like a river frozen in time. So you've got uh, the, the science of geology, which is its own discipline, which as a paleontologist who's trying to construct a story, you've got to be able to recognize that. Then you've got assembling dentition and bones and footprints which is like a secondary kind of fossil like this is an impression they left yeah. and then you have this new science which is the dna yeah and to what extent has the emergence of dna science confirmed or made you rearrange your thinking from the fossil and geological evidence that you've been living with for so much time the DNA revolution is a, a, a big deal for, for many things. A lot of this really started in the 90s with the Human Genome Project. Right. This was also the same time that DNA started to be you know, a really important component of, of court cases, of right. identifying murders and so on. And of course, you know, all the afternoon talk shows started to <laughs> use those paternity tests right. to identify the real father. Uh, at the same time, scientists started to use DNA to understand evolution and to build family trees. So, you know, we want to know as scientists, 
what's related to what. What things are, what animals are close cousins, what animals are more distantly related, what that family tree looked like. The same way we want to know for our own families. If we want to understand right. our own family history, how our family has developed over time, how our families have come together with marriages and children and so the on. The search for that. common ancestors, whether within exactly. our own family tree or the evolutionary tree. Exactly. So that's in order to understand evolution and understand change over time, you have to have that family tree for context. And so traditionally, people would make family trees either of fossils or of modern day animals based on features of the anatomy, whether it's the bones or the muscles, the skin, whatever it is. But in the 90s, people started to use DNA. And DNA is, by and large, just a more appropriate and more accurate way of building family trees than, than anatomy. And so that did lead to a revolution in our understanding of the relationships of today's mammals. And there were some big changes. People used to think, for instance, that uh, all these different mammals that ate insects, all these little shrews and, and other little things were all, all formed their own little group of insect eaters. No, no, it turns out they're interspersed across the mammal family tree. Lots of mammals have independently evolved the ability to eat insects. It used to be thought that elephants, you know, pachyderms, uh, grouped with other big animals, with animals with hooves and so on. No, no, it turns out that elephants are part of a largely African group of homegrown native animals that include weird things like some of those insect eaters. And it goes on and on. There are just lots of unusual things. Whales, you know, the DNA showed that whales evolved from hoofed mammals, things that were like deer and sheep and cows. So all this came together really in the 90s. And it's changed our understanding of modern day mammals. Now with fossil mammals, mm -hmm. it has had an impact. With fossil dinosaurs, not so much. The problem is that DNA breaks down really quickly after an organism dies. And so although so many people, believe me, so many people around the world are looking for dinosaur DNA. I think every paleontologist would love to be the first person to say, I found dinosaur DNA, just like in the movie. Right. But nobody's found it yet because to get dinosaur DNA, that's going to have to be preserved for at least 66 million years. You know, those were the last dinosaurs at the time of the asteroid. And nobody's ever found even a tiny little single base pair. But with mammals, there are some fossil mammals that went extinct very recently. Things like woolly mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, they lived only 10,000 years ago. And you can still find the frozen, preserved carcasses of these animals there was just one that was found uh in canada a few days ago it's, it's it's gone viral it's made huge international news this tiny little baby mammoth it's really sad but it fell into a pond it was frozen it was just uncovered by gold miners and everything's there the the fur the skin the internal organs and the dna so we do have dna of things like woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers and that allows us to place them more accurately on the family tree. And it may, 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 may allow us to clone or resurrect some of these animals in the future, which is a whole different thing. Ethically, you know, there's a lot of questions, but it's something that becomes in the realm of the possible. Simple. Bringing back a T-Rex seems pretty unlikely. I'll never say never, scientists, we never wanna say no, never, that shuts us off to new discoveries. But it's unlikely that we can bring back a T-Rex because nobody's ever found any DNA. But for something like a woolly mammoth, it is squarely in the realm of possibility. Well, we have um, the DNA of, of dino birds all around us. Uh, so I guess that's easily captured. And then maybe in the event someday, you know, you can work that back. Interestingly enough, you can calculate, I believe, sort of the rate of mutations and then make a, an assumption about the time frame and match that with some of the geological records. Is that correct? Am I, am I wrong? That's right. This is something else that came out of the DNA revolution of the 90s is, you know, we can take two modern day species, let's say, you know, let's say a monkey and uh, an elephant, and we can compare their DNA and we can see the percentage difference. And we know something from lab experiments about the overall rate that DNA mutate. And so you can then use that to back calculate when those animals would have had a common ancestor. And in this case, that common ancestor would have been like the common ancestor of modern day placental mammals that give live birth to baby young. 
Right. And so you can do that. You can make that prediction. And some of these predictions are that these mammals did have ancestors that went back into the Cretaceous period that probably lived with the dinosaurs. So there may have been some primates, some rodents, some hoofed mammals that were living with the dinosaurs. We have not found their fossils yet. So maybe the DNA evidence is wrong or we're interpreting it wrong, or maybe the fossils just haven't been found yet because fossils are rare. Only a fraction of what of things that have ever lived will ever be turned into a fossil. So this is one of the most active debates in mammal research. Did the modern day mammal groups have ancestors that were there with the dinosaurs, or did these modern groups evolve, originate, start to develop right after the asteroid? And we don't have a firm answer to that yet. But you did say that mammals coexisted with dinosaurs. Yes. Yeah, so I'm talking about modern man. I'm talking about, you know, were there elephants? Were there primates? Mm -hmm. Were there bats? Like the modern types of mammals living with the dinosaurs. So this we is. We know there were mammals, but they, the fossils we have of the mammals from the Jurassic and Cretaceous that live with the dinosaurs are more primitive mammals. They're like Got ancestral it. stock. One of the stories I loved in the, uh, in the mammal book was how Thomas Jefferson, who was a. <laughs> A, a big time naturalist, as was Teddy Roosevelt. Both had uh, paleontology friends, right? We're extremely interested in the uh, natural world. You posit the possibility, not literally, that the Louisiana Purchase was maybe something that Jefferson got because, <laughs> damn it, he wanted to find a live woolly mammoth. So he sent those two guys, Lewis and Clark, out into the American interior to find it. And uh, they didn't find one, damn. It's, yeah. it's true. I mean, Jefferson explicitly told Lewis and Clark, go find me a, a mammoth, a living mammoth. And so the backstory here is, and it's, kind of, it's a little bit of a long backstory, but, but I'll give it to you. I think it's fascinating. In the 1700s, the first fossils that were found in North America that were discovered and scrutinized and identified correctly, and it was all written down, these were teeth of mammoths that were found in South Carolina by a group of slaves, which is really a, a remarkable story. They were digging in a swamp. They pulled out these objects. Each one was a, about the size of a brick. They had enamel on one surface. They had a set of corrugated ridges, look kind of like the what we would say is like the sole of a tennis shoe. And nobody, the others there didn't know what they were. And some of the slaves said, we know what these are. These are elephant teeth. We know elephants. Oh, because they had, we, and they had seen them in Africa. Yes, they had seen them and lived with them in Africa before they were kidnapped and enslaved and brought, brought to America. And right. so you can just imagine how incredulous this would have been to the, the plantation owners and, and, and the other folks. You know, elephants in North America? Like, this is crazy. There's no elephants here. But once th these enslaved people identified those, those teeth, more started to come out of the woodwork. And before long, people were finding complete skeletons of these giant elephants with big sweeping tusks uh, across North America. And then people started to find and, and, and describe other giant mammal bones, bones of, of ma mammalian things that clearly were not living in North America, or at least in the eastern part of North America anymore. And one of these was a bunch of bones that were found in a cave in Virginia. and shockingly, it, this is so hard to imagine given our current world and our current political climate, but, you know, a, after uh, George Washington, um, you know, gave up the presidency uh, after two terms, there was an election, you know, who would be the next president? John Adams versus Thomas Jefferson. And Adams won the election and it was bitter. I mean, those guys, they, they were once friends, they grew to hate each other. Adams barely won. It was such a contentious election. And by the, you know, the way the Electoral College worked back then, Jefferson right. became the vice president. Right. Less than one week after he was inaugurated as vice president in 1797, Thomas Jefferson was standing up delivering a research talk in Philadelphia about these new fossil bones that were found in Virginia. And so can you imagine that, like a, a sitting vice president less than a week after the inauguration, like in today's world, going to a scientific conference and delivering a research paper? I mean, it's just crazy. But that was Jefferson. He did right. everything. Right. So, he, the true Renaissance person, you know. He was. And, you know, of course, Jefferson has his sordid, you know, history to him as well. Right. He was a very complicated character, but he was somebody with a huge number of interests. And bones and fossils and prehistory is one of them. Now, Jefferson, these bones... One of them was a huge claw, and he 
thought it looked like the claw of a lion. So he identified it as an American lion that was bigger than any lion known today, which mm -hmm. proved, you know, during the early part of U.S. history that the United States was was dynamic and had vitality. And, you know, it was all swept up in the politics. Now, a little bit later, Jefferson determined that actually it wasn't a lion. It was uh, a sloth claw because of the bones of a giant sloth, a 10 right. foot tall sloth that lived which, on the ground and walked on its knuckles was found in, North, in South America. Which we have here in the tar pits, sloths yes, and, and, and camels can, and horses. Exactly. And, and, Smilodons, saber teeth. Yes. So these are all the mega fun. And so Jefferson started to realize, and many other people at the time, in the very latest 1700s, very early 1800s, that there were all of these different species of giant mammal. Their bones were littered across the eastern United States. Obviously, they didn't live there anymore. So what happened to them? Now, a lot of naturalists of the day said, well, these things must be extinct. They once lived, they no longer live. Now, we take that for granted today, but at that time, that was a revolutionary idea. And for Jefferson, he could not accept that. Now, Jefferson had very complex religious views. You know, he wasn't a traditional Christian, but he was more of a deist. And, and, and he saw, a, you know, a, a creator as having created a perfect world and a world with ideals and archetypes and so on, where everything had its place. That was a big problem in Jefferson's thinking that we now realize today, his attitude towards slaves, for instance. But, um, but he, he could not conceive that a creator would make an animal and then kill it off. Kill it. So he did not believe in extinction. It didn't fit his worldview. So he felt that, okay, these things once lived in eastern North America. Maybe they just migrated away. And they must be living out west in the unexplored territories. So in in the when, then Jefferson became president, right? 1803, president. 1802, yeah. yeah. And then he bought the Louisiana Purchase from right. Napoleon. There were many reasons he bought. Of course, it like doubled the size of the U.S. and all the mineral resources and, right. and the trade routes and everything. But one of the reasons that he also bought it was because he wanted to prove that these giant mammals were not extinct. So when he sent Lewis and Clark out to survey the, the Louisiana territory, he gave them a list of things to do. And one of the explicit things, along with make contact with Native American tribes and, you know, find mineral resources, one of the things on that list was discover living mammoths and giant mammals to prove that these things are not extinct. And Lewis and Clark looked. Oh, they looked, but they didn't find any. Jefferson still couldn't admit he was wrong. Instead, he ordered a lot of his generals to collect as many bones of these giant mammals as they could find so he could understand them better. He brought these bones to the White House. He laid out skeletons of mammoths in the East Room of the White House. And as he ducked in and out of meetings, he would spend time relaxing, you know, resting his brain, putting the bones of these mammoths back together, then go off to the next meeting. Uh, and, and, Crazy. And, and so he was obsessed with this. But by the 1820s, you know, after he was president and he was in retirement, him and John Adams, they became friends again. Very famously, they died on the same day. Uh, but they were writing letters to each other before then. And in one of those letters, Jefferson admits to Adams, I was wrong. We've looked and looked and looked. We can't find any of these animals alive, alive anymore. They must have gone extinct. extinct. And when, when Jefferson admitted it, pretty much everybody seemed to fall in line. So that's a convoluted story there. The point is, I mean, these fossils of mammoths and saber-toothed tigers and giant sloths, these things captivated people. They have captivated people forever. Right. And we, our ancestors would have encountered the real we ones. We would have lived in contemporaneous times with this, yes. which yes. begs the question that these megafauna that we, you've just described, they had survived previous ice ages as well as presumably the last one. But the big difference was the rise of humanity, it's, as far as we know. And it seems that we perhaps were a part of their demise in some fashion, although there's very little proof of it, as far as I know. The megafauna was sublime. And let's just take a moment to appreciate what these things were up until about 10,000 years ago, which is nothing in the scheme of Earth history. Right. This was the end of the, the last glacial advance of, of, of the Ice Age. So up until about 10,000 years ago, give or take, there would have been woolly mammoths, woolly rhinoceroses, saber-toothed tigers, dire wolves, American lions, cave hyenas. There would have been armadillos the size of 
Volkswagens. There would have been these sloths that lived on the ground and were 10 feet tall and could right. dunk a basketball, you know, if they, if right. they, if they wanted to. Uh, there were beavers the size of humans. There were deer with antlers the size of dinner tables. Uh, in Australia, there were wombats that weighed three tons. There were kangaroos that were too plump to hop. And I could go on and on and on. Right. And on. These were magnificent. I'm getting hungry as you speak. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> well, our, and that's probably part of the problem that our ancestors, <laughs> you know, when they encounter these animals, so the Homo sapiens, our species evolved in Africa kind of between two and 300,000 years ago. Um, the date's always changing a little bit as new fossils are found. So probably more like 300,000 years ago. And then they moved out of Africa. And as they moved out of Africa, they spread around the world. And each new place they would go, they would encounter these giant mammals. And these would have been the ones that if they could hunt them, they could feed, you know, so many humans for such a long time. So they were obvious targets of hunting. Or we flightless have, birds, large flightless, flightless birds. birds. Are, yeah, because not only mammals, you know, humans have caused a lot of extinctions. And oftentimes the biggest things, the most defenseless things were the ones that went extinct first. Right. And, you know, we have skeletons of woolly mammoths that have like, arrowheads embedded in them. These were things that were killed and eaten by humans. So really everywhere where humans went, the megafauna soon died. Now, there were climate changes, too. I mean, we were coming out of this big glacial period. It switched very quickly to a warmer period. Climate may have played a role, too. It was really probably that one-two punch. Of There's a lot of pressures at once. It's not just yes. one thing. There's this whole kaleidoscope i i did a family tree all my i say this is is that all my ancestors are from africa so you know my own conception of like the beginning of humanity in perhaps the old divide gorge is that modern humans and I, I mean this is part of what you do because you have this extensive fossil record but at some point you have to take an imaginary leap and take all this stuff that you've put downloaded into your brain all these fossils and interrupt if i'm wrong dna geology <laughs> and then like they did in jurassic park by the way i saw the brusati lecture hall <laughs> and Harry, what a, that was the best credit i've ever seen in movies wow. see the movie um but my larger point is at some point you've got to take an imaginary leap you do it in your book and it's beautifully done because it's also contemporary history whether the the cowboy uh, fossil wars in the old west which seems like a great canvas for a movie that's never been done you know these eastern uh, uh megalomaniacs collecting yeah. fossil bones for their their it, it, million dollar museums and these cowboys out there fighting over it well there's the movie let's go come on let's write it yeah. i'm ready steve i'm <laughs> flying out tomorrow to scotland let's get to work at some point it has to live in your imagination and i yeah. see that you've done that in your books and i just want you to comment on that Absolutely. Um, when it comes to fossils, what we are almost always dealing with are old bones and old teeth and old shells, old skeletons. Uh, occasionally, you might get a feather preserved or some hair or a bit of skin or something. But by and large, you know, we have these ancient petrified bits of animals. And so we do have to have a good imagination. That doesn't mean we, you know, make stuff up and all that, but it means we have to be able to see beyond these objects in front of us. And what that really means is drawing inferences to animals alive today and understanding modern day animals. That's one of the reasons why family trees are so important, understanding how the extinct species are related to the modern day ones, because we can then use close relatives today to better understand what the extinct species looked like and how they moved and how they behaved. But I think any good paleontologist has to be able to just conceptually, mentally, go beyond the bone you're holding and in your mind see this as part of this animal that's no longer with us that once lived and so you know a, a big part of, of what i try to do with with communicating science whether it's doing things like consulting on on the jurassic world film so i was the paleontology uh, <laughs> advisor on the film that's why that lecture theater in there was named after me that's a nice little easter egg that uh, the production designer Kevin very Jenkins nice job just, <laughs> I saw that last night, folks. I'm going, I'm talking to him tomorrow. That's Bruce Lee's lecture. Okay. You know, when I first saw it, I was like, whoa, because he he told me there might be something in there. So I was looking. I said, holy crap, he did so. Am I the first cool. person that saw it that was just <laughs> out there? Other people have noticed. It's funny. People are hitting me up on Twitter and saying, hey, I saw the lecture. So I'm, I'm surprised. When I watch a movie, I never have that good of attention. Yeah, I, yeah, Maybe yeah. it's just my imagination is going off somewhere. Yeah. But, but anyway, the point is that, you know, I love doing this thing, working on films, writing books. I, I like um, 
communicating this quite esoteric, let's face it, you know, science that we do of digging up and describing and interpreting old bones. And I, I like bringing this to people in different ways. And, and that includes things like, you know, a blockbuster movie where these things are movie monsters, but it's rooted in a lot of the science. I, I take a lot of pride in being able to contribute to that. And I saw the feathers. Back. I saw the feathers. I saw feathers, the feathers. Right. I mean, we finally get feathers in some of the Jurassic Park dinosaurs, which paleontologists like me have been begging for for a long time. And Colin Trevorrow, the director, from the first time I met him, he said, we're going to do it this time. And I felt it a great privilege to be able to help him bring those feathered dinosaurs to the screen. Um, but you have to have imagination. I mean, we do find fossil feathers. We do find fossil yeah. wings. We can tell the colors in some cases. The pigment vessels are preserved. But you still need to take that leap beyond this object in front of you. And so in the film and then in the books, I try to do the same. One of the things I try to do in the book, you know, a lot of the chapters, not all of them, but maybe about half of them, I, I open up with these great. fictional stories. It's great. kind of, you know, a few pages of being back 12 million years ago. Let's when go Cretaceous, was baby. A safari. Yeah, yeah well, it was a, was a savanna. You could go on safari. There were camels and elephants and horses living in Nebraska, you know. And these are total. These are not, you know, they're fictional, but they're based on real fossil sites and real evidence. And I outline all that evidence in the references section because mm -hmm. it is a science book. You know, I'm a scientist. <laughs> I'm an academic. I'm a professor. I, you know, I need to keep this evidence base. You know, that that's my job. But we can use that evidence and communicate it in this imaginative way. And so, you know, I do that in the book here and there. I, I think, I hope it adds, you know, some richness and it helps us to think about what these animals were actually like when they were alive. And I, I, I hope that makes things like, you know, these fossil horses that are the size of poodles and, you know, these yeah, rhinos great. that once lived in America, things we can scarcely imagine. I hope it makes them more understandable and relatable. Well, I'm going to posit one theory, sort of my vision of the origins of humanity is that modern humanity comes through a very narrow aperture with not gazillions of individuals. I mean, if you compare our bodies to mammoths, they would kick our ass one on one, clearly or saber-toothed cats were, were incredibly vulnerable. I mean, I'm in shape, but still. So what was the advantage? And to me, it has to be communication and language and organization in a way that other primates really hadn't nailed yet. And all of a sudden, if I can give you instructions and this person instructions, and we can collaborate in a way that other creatures can't, traps, we don't do combat. I, Jared Diamond's book, I remember, he says, the, 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 the pre-industrial or pre-agricultural people, they don't take risks. They don't have hospitals. They don't have infrastructure. If you get wounded, you're done. You're over. So I think that humanity had a thing for communication and collaboration that allowed for its primacy over these other mammal cousins that were all around us, including other uh, homo sapiens or you know, the Neanderthals and whomever. It seems to me that skill probably was the big advantage, but I don't have the fossils to prove it. <laughs> no, I th and this is a great question to end out as I'm going to have to uh, escape uh, after this for family. Your family, time. family yes. time. So I got a uh, two and a half year old and uh, who's All teaching right. me a lot about mammals, by the way, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all good. about uh, hair and milk and teeth. Steve, and all I'm things. digging this so much. It's, I would <laughs> like to continue. I want to go on a dig. I could talk forever. Yeah, yeah but this is a good one to end on because, you know, we are a mammal. You know, mm -hmm. we're pretty awesome. Let's face it. We are. We're a sublime species. I mean, there's nothing that approaches our intelligence. Um, we are conscious. Uh, we have language, you know, very advanced language. We work together in groups a lot. These are things that can you know, combined together, make humans very distinctive. And they allow us to have such an impact on the world today. We can affect the world like no other mammal before. Yes. Um, yet we are another mammal. We're one of 6,000-ish species of mammals. All these other things alive today, from bats and whales to dogs and cats and elephants, they are all our close cousins. And we can learn a lot from them and we should appreciate them. But we are different from them in our intelligence and consciousness and in our communication and group work. And to me, you know, you can see in the fossil record these human species evolving in Africa. We are it's largely an African story. Our roots are in Africa. Uh, different waves of humans came out of Africa at different times and Homo sapiens eventually spread all around the world. 
but you can see the fossils as these apes, you know, basically come out of the tree, start walking upright first. That mm -hmm. seems to have been the key that freed the hands probably to make tools and communicate. The brains got bigger and you start to see human species proliferate and spread all around. And of course, then later on, you know, clearly we developed advanced language and other and other capabilities. Um, that starts to get out of my comfort zone, really. Once you start getting into human evolution, especially cultural evolution, that's where I don't pretend to be any kind of expert. There's lots of great books out there yeah. on that subject. Well, but maybe I think we're seeing COVID as re evolution in real time, like we're seeing. Well, yeah, we are. And, and it's a good point to end on with COVID. I mean, we're seeing the virus change and mutate and new variants emerge. This is what evolution does. This is kind of, you know, a microcosm in a way of, of you know, how humans evolve, how other species have evolved. This constant change, constant adaptation, resiliency. Uh, and, and for mammals, mammals have been resilient. I mean, mammals have gotten through over well over 200 million years of climate changes global warming ice ages volcanoes asteroids mammals have been resilient here we are having this conversation it's a remarkable evolutionary story and, Bill, and i would I thank you, for talking. Give thank me you. and i would say that human intelligence is no less natural than a t-rex taking a shit in the woods <laughs> it's all the product of evolution you know right. it, it all is right and, um you know it's so we should cherish these things that make us remarkable we should also be humble and acknowledge that we are mammals we are animals we are part of this long evolutionary pedigree a rich family tree and we should do our best to conserve the world around us well steve i want to thank you once twice for your two incredible books the, the big overview thank of you. the dinos and the mammals i think you know you're a mammal and a dino guy i desperately now want to go on a dig I say that, um, I'm open to any invitations. I see you're a White Sox fan in Scotland. There's not many yeah. there. Um, <laughs> no, there's not many. I mean, it's a tough year to be a White Sox fan. Though. Yeah, they're having a tough year, but they've yeah. had a lot of tough years since Tinker's. We're playing in LA. Speak, actually, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hope to meet you in person. Yeah, absolutely. Congrats on the lecture hall in the Jurassic Park <laughs> movie. You're forever memorialized. And folks, check out these books. Until next time, namaste, shalom, and aloha. By that, I mean you all know it. Namashaloha. See ya.